All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Around the Birdbath. As always, I'm your host, Dan Nerdall. And starting off this episode by recapping UTSA's final Tuesday game of the regular season, final home game of the regular season. And our guest for this week, you may have heard him on some other Alamo Audible wavelengths and seen him on YouTube with his big interview with Frank Harris, but uh, CJ Benavidez, is that, is that how I apologize? Is that how you say your last name? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly how you say it. You, you, you said it right. You said it perfectly. Wonderful. Perfect. How are you perfect. doing tonight, man? Doing good, man. We had, you know, I had a great time. Uh, took a buddy of mine to uh, UTSA's last home game uh, against UIW. Um, and yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, I couldn't ask for a better night, better weather, especially since yesterday. Uh, and uh, yeah, I ran into you, Dan, uh, and uh, chatted it up, and we had a good time. No, for sure. Yeah, and and, and you you mentioned the weather. You know, at least in San Antonio and across a lot of Texas yesterday, just some crazy weather. I didn't know if they were gonna like you know. Um, ECU canceled their Tuesday game. Charlotte canceled their Tuesday game. You know, sometimes teams get a little creative towards the end of the season, if we'll say it that way, especially with a short week this week coming up for all the teams. But turned into it was a hot afternoon, turned into a beautiful evening. I want to ask you real quick, since you mentioned, obviously, you were at the game and we sat, you know, kind of right next to each other. There was an aisle separating us. You were obviously a student at UTSA. What did you think of the new seating and the new birdbath experience? I'll tell you what, uh, it was actually, it's, it's a, it's an eye refresher. That's for sure. Cause it's different. Um, mm-hmm. and I think that's something that, uh, as time has gone on when, so when I started at UTSA, which was 2018, uh, I experienced a lot of changes uh, through the UTSA athletic department and seeing uh, UTSA get that for, you know, the baseball stadium. I mean, it's great. Uh, I like the direction that it's, you know, slowly going. Um, and I, I mean, it was cool. I got to meet a lot of people. Um, and, and again, like just the change of scenery is great. Even if it's just a, even if it's just uh, just some different types of seating. Uh, it, it, it's great to see just change and updates coming uh, every so often because it, you know, it shows that, you know, the university, uh, cares not only, you know, with the biggest product of football, but, you know, with baseball and other sports as well. But again, like to reiterate, just the change of scenery going to the games and having a seat back was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not done yet. Everyone understands that there's more to be done. I can appreciate that, you know, they're doing some things. And I, I've mentioned this before. It seems like the way they're building it, they're definitely building it to add on to it and continue to build on it. It's not like they have to start over every time. And so they're they're definitely thinking through with that. Um, and, you know, so better viewing experience for the fans, but also a great product on the field tonight. UTSA playing Crosstown Rivals, Incarnate Word. You know, last month they made it a little interesting. They got behind early. It looked dicey again, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, it's 2023 again, and UIW is going to walk this thing off the way they did last year. But UTSA got down to business right away, scoring four runs in the bottom of the first, never looking back, and then ultimately ending up with a run rule in eight innings, 13-3 to final score. That also got them their 30th win and they amassed 30 wins for the third consecutive season. So um, really solid performance across the board, hitting wise, pitching wise, defense. There was one little snafu on defense we'll talk about. It wasn't a huge deal, but what were some of your general thoughts just from the game overall and just what you saw on the field? You know, I was uh, before the game started, I was pretty excited because, it, it, you know, it's uh, it's one thing to play another school in the same state in a different city. But it's almost like another thing to play another school in the same city, in the same state. And so you just you know, you never really know what you're going to get sometimes, uh, you know, UIW uh, has come a very long way as 
as far as our athletics program is concerned. Uh, so is UTSA. And so like, you know, I, I truly didn't really know what to expect. I mean, it wasn't a game that UTSA absolutely had to win, uh, but it's a good prepper going into the following series to come as the baseball season slowly coming to a close or fast, I guess, however you see it. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, that will, this game will show how these next series will go. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And, and baseball, like, you know, it's all about momentum, right? I mean, sports mm-hmm. are like that in general baseball, maybe more so than others. Here's, you know, here's a little crazy stat for you since we were talking about, the score and everything and just coming into this game and then winds and feel good going into the finals weekend series of the regular season. They scored as many runs tonight as they did across the South Florida series. Wow. Huh. So, That's freaking, so yeah. Yeah. In the South Florida series, they, they won five, two, they lost three, six and they won five, three. So. Obviously, obviously, yeah. UIW on a Tuesday is a little different than South Florida across the weekend, but um, just it goes to show like how wild this sport can be. <laughs> oh yeah, like the the change of the tide. I mean, it literally, like like I said, you know, anything could happen. I feel like, especially in college baseball, like I, it could be you know one team's night for sure, and another team's not so night. <laughs> and uh, you know, tonight UTSA really played very well tonight against UIW. I mean, I, I was watching, you know, the outfielders, they're, they're playing out of their minds. Uh, you know, people were hitting well. Uh, and it, it didn't seem like there were many hiccups as you've seen throughout the mid part of the season. Uh, and it, it just looks so it, it like it flowed so well, this game. Uh, it, it was, it was almost, you know, an unrecognizable team. It was just, it just flowed and gel. They all gelled together. It was great. It was great. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, looking across, um, across the stat line, like almost everybody who registered in a bat got a base hit with Joyce, the catcher was the only one who didn't get a base hit, but wit hit the ball hard a couple times and he, he got a RBI, like uh, brought a runner in on an RBI. And so that obviously helps and shows up on the stat line. Um, you know, and there's so many things that don't show up on the box score. And you mentioned the outfield play. Some of those plays, they can go a different way depending on the jump that an outfielder gets. And so sometimes, you know, UTSA's outfielders can make – some difficult plays look a little more routine by how well they can cover ground out there. There was one time where Mason was playing a little deep and mm-hmm. the ball kind of fell between him, Diego and Matt, but that's a hard one. Cause they had already hit a couple balls out to the warning track. And so it's understandable that Mason's playing deep and it just kind of falls in no man's land and UIW scored one of their runs that way. But yeah, I mean, the outfield play, you know, like I was talking to someone about this after the game, you know, James Tauzig in right field, you know, he, he was kind of going back between right field, DH, and first base. And now with Ty Odom injured, James has kind of solidif- solidified himself as the, the starting right fielder. And where James is now, compared to where he was two months ago, um, he's 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 really improved in the outfield this, this season. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know... It it it, sh- it just showed you know on the field you know thirteen to three final score, um and it, it was just it was it was really fun to watch. Uh, it, it's been a while since I got to sit down and watch a UTSA baseball game, uh, and you know this one was a great one to sit down and watch tonight. And even you know I even liked watching the pitching tonight too. The pitching tonight was uh was pretty good. Uh, although the umpire had a interesting uh out box, uh tonight but um <laughs> yeah, but yeah but... it was all good I'll, I'll say this it's a lot easier to uh put up with a inconsistent umpire when the team you're cheering for has a seven run lead um <laughs> because i was I, like i think by the fifth or sixth inning i just had to laugh about it i was like ah that was about you know that would hit the right handed batter if if there was one standing there but he seemed to still call it a strike and 
And I, you know, I saw something tonight I, I've never seen before where the dugout asked the home plate umpire to check check a swing. And I'll be honest, it was obvious that Caleb that Caleb Hill swung or didn't didn't check his swing, but the ump wasn't going to call anything. And then the dugout asked for it. And I didn't, I didn't know the dugout could ask for it. Maybe that's on the umpire. Maybe that's college baseball, but um, it is what it is. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that was pretty interesting. And, and you know, I also love to see the, the camaraderie of the team too. They were pretty lively tonight as the, you know, the team performed very well. And uh, you know, at UIW was uh, pretty quiet in their dugout. Um, <laughs> as the score ran up to 13 to three. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and I think you know these games like you mentioned it like yeah like it wasn't it wasn't a Tuesday game that was going to help UTSA's RPI, you know unfortunately with just like some of the teams closer like there's not as many teams UTSA can play in midweek that's going to help their RPI so it wasn't a conference game of course it wasn't a game that was going to help their RPI but it's a cross town rival and Coach Hallmark and Coach Aguayo came from UIW. Um, you know, these guys have probably, they probably play together in the summer. They have played against each other in high school. A lot of Texas kids, I imagine, if you really broke down the roster. So it means something to them. And, and you know, I think it, it for UTSA, like, they're like, hey, like, we want to be the top dogs in San Antonio. And they're going to play hard. And last month was a close game. But tonight, they came out and right away... um really got really got the show on the road and i think like a lot a lot of what we saw from the pitching was because you know very early on the pitching staff was already working with a five run lead and that can make a big difference yeah yeah and you could definitely see that you know as as the game went on the performance only and I, th- I feel like as if it enhanced itself to each individual player that stepped onto the base uh to hit and you know, I, I really think that it's a good um, it's a good thing to set up a win like this going into your last series of the season, which, you know, F- FAU, um, you know, Florida Atlantic, which isn't necessarily like the biggest uh, pushover team. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's a, it's another thing, too, that we're also not, you know, taking it easy on just any type of game either. We're, we're, we're getting the, the business done and. Uh, or, or the goal is the American Athletic Conference Championship. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think you know, because because if you again getting back to the box score, you look at the box score and you're like, okay, Incarnate Word where made four errors. Um, because at one point UTSA only had like six hits on the board and five or six runs, but that still I think comes from putting pressure on on these teams and, and putting the ball in play and making fielders make a play. You know, you mentioned the American athletic conference. Like I at a few different times this season have mentioned that I think Tuesday games are very similar and kind of resonate a little bit with a tournament game. You're tired, you know, maybe like you're tired for a tournament game. You've traveled for a Tuesday game. Um, You know, the time might not be great for when you're playing and, and there can be a lot of different factors, but it definitely felt good to see UTSA just have a comfortable win and just, you know, you could, you could just sense like what you've mentioned, just the, the feeling from the dugout just mm-hmm. kind of had a looseness to it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, like you said before, uh like, yeah, UIW definitely had a lot of mistakes in the game. Um, and you could tell it was due to po- the possible stress of trying to catch up uh, <laughs> as the score kept growing and growing and growing, um, which is understandable. I mean, you, you want to maximize uh, each move as the best possibility and, you know, stop UTSA from scoring. And, you know, there was a lot of the time where UIW was, um, you know, there to make the play. And then, you know, somebody's not catching the ball with the mitt and it's going over the head, it's going far right, far left. And it's, and it's costing up, you know, bases and runs. And that, that's ultimately what a lot of the 13 score was 13 runs were for UTSA. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, 
the mental errors that you that UIW uh, just couldn't shake. Yeah, and it's interesting. I know we were talking about this before we started recording because you're like a. I mean, I know you're super pumped about college football 25 coming out, um, and you're a big gamer. Do you ever play MLB The Show? Oh yes, yes. I've actually, <laughs> I have attempted to play MLB The Show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So like it's funny because I I play MLB the show quite a bit, and there's like I'm not a I wouldn't consider myself a huge gamer, but there's only so many different situations that like the the game builders, I'm guessing can put into the gameplay right for the way like a batter mm-hmm. like hits the ball like you'll see like even in a game like you hit a ground ball the exact same way several different times and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And that happened tonight where like incarnate word hit a high chopper that got over Mark Henning's head and he's a tall guy. And then that's where UTSA kind of like sailed it over second. And then they threw it home and it was kind of like throwing the ball all over the place. Um, But then UTSA had the same thing happen to them. Like they hit a high chopper, went over the first baseman's head. You know, they didn't sail it quite as much, but it was like, all right, like the game makers have us on replay here. <laughs> like both teams are getting their shot at a high chopper, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, this was also while, like, I think two to three times during the game, there was like bases loaded for UTSA. And a lot of, again, a lot of those times it was just simple over the head, you know, hits and UIW just couldn't, you know, just couldn't capitalize. And it was just a, Sometimes it was a very awkward hit that just go literally like looks like air was just bending the ball around their head where it just it was just almost impossible to, to catch. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was a great night, a great game. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what UTSA does against FAU in this next series uh, in the coming days. Um, and then seeing where we fall, you know, postseason because uh, I'm, I, you know, last season, it seems like we go through the same cycle. But I just, you know, I just, I really want to see a different, you know, I, I want to see a different this time. And uh, I, I really hope this season to do it. Um, and we and we get over that hump of, uh, of triumph. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I was talking to somebody about this tonight because East Carolina you know, they so they didn't play tonight against Campbell. I think I mentioned that they canceled their Tuesday game. So they're on a five game losing streak. You know, they mm-hmm. they lost the Sunday game to USF. They lost a Tuesday game to top 10 Duke. I think they lost by like one run. It was a crazy environment at, at their own field. And then they got swept by Tulane. And so now all of a sudden, like in and the listeners are going to hear me talk about this on the the preview podcast as well but we can touch on it for sure here for a minute um now all of a sudden utsa is back in play for regular season aac title they're only one game back from east carolina east carolina's got to play rice rice has some solid pitching and rice themselves like rice is playing they're they've got a lot to play for because if they have a bad weekend they could find themselves left out of the tournament and it's kind of crazy because like you look at the, how the American Athletic is lined up, and you've got two games that separate the number three from the number eight seed. Um, and so like Rice could be as high as like the the four or five seed, or they could just not even be in the tournament because only eight teams get to go. It's not like softball where all the teams get to go. Um, so it's gonna be a wild weekend, and it's gonna be a wild tournament, like. Last year, you kind of had a pretty good idea going into the last weekend, like how the seeds were going to be. I have no idea how they're going to finish up this weekend. We'll know by yeah. Saturday evening, um, but there is so much uncertainty, and the teams that are playing each other can really mess things up. Um, I think Memphis is pretty much, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this now, they're probably going to sweep and make their way into the tournament, but they're two games back from the eight spot, so they probably have the toughest time of making it in, but these teams have just kind of beat each other up all season for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, now that, you know, though we're talking about it, like I'm, you know, and I'm looking at the standings here and, uh, you know, UTSA second in the American conference right now. And 
yeah, ECU is on a, a five week losing streak or a five game losing streak. Sorry. And uh, yeah, it, you know, it only takes one game and, you know, that could literally change the tide on, you know, momentum for us just going in, you know, the postseason. Uh, but we also also have to win uh, this FAU series and, you yeah. know, we got to finish out. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, um, and that's the other thing I was getting at too. Like, you know, UTSA, like, even if like, you know, the, uh, the handful of guys that were on the team last year and, you know, remember what the tournament was like last year and remember that feeling, but then UTSA has dealt with adversity. Um, and they've had, they've had to show resiliency all season long, you know, the first weekend of the season, having some infielders, having an infielder and outfielder go down. They've got some guys right now that aren't hundred percent. They've had some pitchers that have not had the best outings and had, have had to battle back. They've had some pitchers to get injured and have to work their way back. So like they've been in the trenches and, and they've managed to still find ways to win pretty consistently. You know, their record maybe isn't quite where they wanted it to be. They've lost some games. They shouldn't have lost, but Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that's going to help them come tournament time. And the one thing I'll say is those guys are going to give it all they've got and they're going to play hard and they're going to leave it all on the field. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. It's a tremendous, tremendous statement. I agree. I mean, you know, push comes to shove, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's going to get to a certain point where it's, you know, win or go home. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure they understand that at a certain point. They've been there, done that type of ordeal. So I'm ready to get it going. I'm ready to watch it. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Before we wrap up, let's get back to the pitching just real quick. Um, you know, I think I mentioned to you before the game, like I didn't really know. I was curious to see how Coach Hallmark and his staff were going to treat the game because the conference series starts on Thursday. Um, you want like baseball is not really the type of sport where you can just like take it off. I mean, what you've seen, like everyone's seen before, like when teams have, you know, when they rest players a little bit and there's the age old conversation, like, do you rest your guys? Do you keep playing them? Cause baseball is such a sport about wanting to like be playing like hot and stuff. Um, so, you know, makes sense with the pitching staff. Everyone got about an inning. Orlas, he got a little more than an inning. Ryan Beard got just shy of three innings, but then the other guys, Longshore, Royce, Miles, and Ward, um, each get an inning apiece. And between those four guys, just two runs allowed, one earned. Kind of what we talked about there earlier with that that hop and um, and the errors and stuff. So, you know, probably feels good for those guys too. Cause those are some guys that have, have struggled at times and struggled recently at times. So probably feels good for them, you know, especially like Ryan Ward, a senior have a pretty good outing his or a very good outing his last um, time at the bird bath. But like, like what, what you've talked about a lot, just getting the, getting the cobwebs out and playing some good baseball. And even if it's against a lesser team, you know, just, reminding yourself that you've got what it takes yeah yeah absolutely i mean you couldn't have said it any better it again you know it's it's just uh it's just one of those things where it's just going to come down to uh you know which utsa team's going to show up this <laughs> next series and then after that series the athletic conference championship series you know like it's just that's what it's going to come down to um and you know i'm, I'm excited to see it i'm ecstatic i mean I feel like if it, you know, if it was, maybe it's just me, but if it was any year, I feel like it'd be this year to see a different outcome to the season than Mm -hmm. last year in a positive light, of course. Yeah, for sure. Any, um, any last takeaways? I know you kind of just shared some thoughts, but any last takeaways that maybe something from the game that you, that like in a bat that stood out, a, a pitchy performance that stood out that we haven't already mentioned. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know the last the last few innings of the game, uh, I feel like that pitching was was going crazy. Uh, you know, uh, UIW was just seemed pretty lost when it came to uh, <laughs> I can't even, sorry, I can't even think of his name, but he was going crazy on the pitching in like the last few innings. Um, oh my goodness, what was his name? 
like like the UTSA pitcher? Yes. Yes. Well, they had a UTSA couple of different pitcher. guys out there. So they had mm-hmm. so Royce uh mm-hmm. Zach Longshore got the the fifth. Mm-hmm. Zach Royce got the sixth. Connor Miles got the seventh, and then Ryan Ward got the eighth. Okay. I think it was the eighth, I think. I believe. Yeah. The eighth. And um yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the pitching was pretty good today. Uh, you know, I, I enjoyed watching it. Um, the hitting was, you know, awesome as well because, you know, I always love seeing people hit baseballs and just just making plays. Yeah. That, that's that's what I just I love seeing people make plays, and so that that's a, I feel like that's what I saw a lot of today. And um, you know, I don't I don't make it out enough to UTSA baseball, but. After the performance tonight, I mean, I now I want to, uh, you know, more often than not. Uh, so I'm excited to see, you know, where this where this ship goes and um, where it ends up. Well, baseball players are pretty superstitious. So, um, you know, maybe you're the good luck charm and maybe you need to start <laughs> looking at your your travel plans and book your flight to Florida and get down to the tournaments oh man <laughs> don't tell me with a good time i love florida i love florida <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's gonna be in clear water too so uh Ooh. right on the beach there oh my goodness and uh you know you mentioned the pitchers it was it was we were just kind of talking about it some me and some people in the stands because fisher kingsbury was warming up maybe just to get some work in one last outing on from the bird bath for him and utsa run rules UAW in the eighth inning, so the game's over, and uh, Fisher didn't get a throw again. But expect to see him this weekend, of course, against FAU, and Fisher's turning it on at the right time and um, a good arm to have. So with that, you know, we'll we'll close it out here with some uh, some Patreon shout outs. You know, as always, a big thanks to those of you who. Support us on Patreon at any tier. You know, we've talked extensively with with the benefits you get with that. Um, a store discount, the extra coverage, early releases on the podcast. And, you know, definitely want to give a big thanks to our Board of Trustees members, DigiT, John Alwell, Gary and Ruben representing the UTSA Bird Gang Tailgate, Ray Renning and Mimi Preparo, Brandon Grill and the Grill Realty Group, Andy Ellis All Day and Proficient Benefit Solutions, Ian McClendon and Secret LLC, Ryan Squires, Waterman Construction, Javon Townsend, VP of the DFW Chapter of the UTSA Alumni Association, UTSA Annual Giving, Artisan Vapor and CBD, and Wayne Gonzalez and Runners Rising Project. And of course, our big money donors, Ben Tovar, The Bunch Family, Zach Esperiquetz and the San Antonio Podcast Network, Alejandro Benavides, Jacob Cavazos, Board President, Board President for the UTSA Alumni Association, John Nally, Brandon Padron, Rick Cortez of Rowdy Road Grillers, and Sumner McDaniel. Uh, CJ, you've never done a have you ever done a Patreon read? Uh, I actually haven't. Uh, but you know, again, like I do like to reiterate, you know, I I, I love the support that the community shows us. Uh, you know, hundred, you, you know, the support y'all show is. We, we feel the love over here. We really do. Um, you know, every, every at least every every week, I, I'm thinking of creative ideas to bring people that support us and uh, out of the box thinking. And I got a couple ideas up my sleeve that, you know, I think some people find uh, amusing in the coming weeks. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, stay tuned. Stay tuned. All right. That's a good little sneak peek there. And I was just going to say, you know, uh, they can be tough to get through sometimes like because I feel like every time I go to do one, there's another name on the list um, either with the big money donors or the board of trustees. And so that's great. Like you mentioned, and we're even uh, Alamo audible is even on LinkedIn now, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are on LinkedIn. You know, if, if you're, you know, alumni current student and you know, you, you want, you know, uh, to follow, you know, our content on LinkedIn or just simply follow our account, you know, just look up Alamo Audible on LinkedIn and our business page is up and going and uh, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, you know, CJ, thanks again for coming on, you know, made it a little late. Uh, Everyone was kind of hanging around the bird bath. You know, the players were talking with fans and all the guys were taking pictures with friends and family and teammates, you know, soaking up the last, 
few moments of playing the last game there. And they travel to Florida tomorrow, uh, depending on when you're listening to this, but they're traveling to Florida on Wednesday. And they've got the series against um, FAU this weekend. Stay tuned after the Kubia break. And I break down the, the series preview with that. And then conference tournament starts next Tuesday, um, a week from tonight. Well, a week from today, from today, because it'll start in the morning. But CJ, before we sign off, where can people find you on on all the socials? Oh, uh, you know, everyone can uh, can find me on uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, you know, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm pretty active on all those three things. Um, it's just CJ Benavides, uh, and yeah, um, appreciate you having me on, Dan. You know. Uh, it's not very often where I get I get invited to the, the baseball episode. It's it's fun. It's been fun. It's really, really fun. And I had a lot of fun with you at the game and uh looking forward to possibly doing some more in the future. Yeah, yeah. No, it was great. Um, appreciate you coming on and appreciate everyone listening. We'll take a quick could be a break and then I'll be back with the FAU preview. So stay tuned. Hey everyone, welcome back from the Cumbia break, and as you heard before we went to the Cumbia break, once again combining the episodes with the shorter week, so you know, you likely just listened to the preview with, or the, I'm sorry, the recap of the UIW game with, with CJ and myself, decided to kick CJ off and do it solo, no I'm just kidding. Um, just with the time and everything and with the, and with the shorter week recording this a little early than nor earlier than normal, um, before the Tuesday game. And I guess if you didn't just listen to the recap on the same episode, then I talked too long for this weekend re- preview and we decided to do it separate. But for now, when I'm recording this, the plan is to have these back to back or on the same episode rather. And again, just with the shorter week, you know, still cover the recap of the UIW game, but then also preview the FAU series. Final conference series of the regular season, final weekend series of the regular season. A lot to play for with both teams. UTSA traveling to Boca Raton to face FAU on the road. Even though both teams were in Conference USA last year and now both teams are in the American Athletic, they, they still went with UTSA was hosting FAU last season or UTSA hosted FAU last season. So FAU is gets to be home field this time against UTSA. And... At the end, you know, we're going to kind of lay out how things look for the conference going into the last weekend. Still a lot that could change based on or for seeds, based on teams that are playing each other. UTSA, after, you know, winning the series against USF and ECU getting swept against by Tulane, the regular season title regular season AAC title is back in play and up for grabs and so we're going to break down kind of what would need to happen for UTSA to have that I will you know so we can be more positive towards the end I'll kind of put the negative out there right away with UTSA's RPI where it is and some of the losses at the start of the season and even more recently I still don't think even with a regular season title conference title and and a really good tournament run i still don't believe based on their rpi and opportunities to move up that an at large chance is there with you know even with fau and their rpi most of the conferences rpi outside of winning the actual tournament I still think that at this point, that's the only way for 
the Roadrunners to get to a regional tournament. And, you know, that doesn't mean that there's nothing in, important and valuable of the regular season title. It still speaks a lot of good things. And it also means that UTSA is playing good baseball when they need to because they most likely still need to win a couple games against FAU to have a chance at that. Not completely, but the way I think things will play out between ECU and Rice. So we'll get to that at the end. This weekend, it's a Thursday through Saturday, so really more a late week. Just one game on the weekend, obviously always pending weather and everything. I don't know if across the conference, like what they would do for weather-wise most likely if if all three games can't get in especially since it's the last weekend it would probably just come down to seeding and and if it matters for seeding purposes maybe a team getting in or not getting in but at the end of the day maybe they'll just go with winning percentage like over like conference winning percentage to 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 break that tiebreaker because um you know the the conference weekend finishes on Saturday. They do have Sunday, so I mean, depending on teams and travel and everything, could stretch things out to Sunday if the conference allowed them to. And I guess it would probably depend on what I just mentioned with seeding and everything. But five thirty on five thirty Central Time on Thursday, three o'clock Central Time on Friday, and then eleven a.m. on Saturday are currently the the scheduled times. Of course, pay attention to weather and and everything with that. Let's talk a little bit about FAU's history real quick. They started their program in 1994, so two years after UTSA started theirs in 1992. They were in the Trans-American, Trans-America Athletic Conference, the Atlantic Sun Conference. Before Conference USA, they were in the Sun Belt. They were in Conference USA from 2014 to 2023, and of course, they moved into the American Athletic Conference with UTSA. They've only had two head coaches in their 30-year uh, history. So Kevin Cooney coached the team from 1994 to 2008, and then current coach John McCormick took over in 2009. They have made it to 12 regionals. Ten of those were at-large bids, so... You know, FAU has the benefit of being on the East Coast. You know, they can play those Florida teams midweek. That can help the RPI. The The guys over at 11.7 College Baseball Podcast spent a good 20 or 30 minutes on one of their more recent episodes breaking down the RPI and discussing if you can crack the code and, you know, talking about some of these mid-major teams that – it seems like they've kind of cracked the code a little bit to no matter what, as long as you win enough games, you can always help that RPI to be in the conversation for and at large. And 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 FAU, a team that has been able to do that at times, as as 10 of those times, 10 of those 12 times they went to regionals were at large. Like I said, their mo- the most recent or their latest regional appearance was in 2019. And then they did make it to a super regional back in 2002. Now, I've talked about this before with RPI. It's more than just scheduling the tough teams. You obviously have to win some of those games. And that's something that FAU has done. They've won 32 games or more every year from 2015 to 2023. From 2015 to 2023. They've reached 32 wins or more. And then even going back a little further, every year since 2010, except for 2014, they've they've reached 32 wins. So just about every year for the last 15 seasons, they've reached 32 wins. And they've only finished under 500 twice in program history. You know, 40 wins is kind of the magic number for a lot of teams, especially mid-majors. If you can reach 40 wins, a lot of times you're sitting pretty nice for that at-large consideration. FAU has reached 40 wins nine times. 40 wins or more at least nine times. 
Their history against UTSA, they do lead the all-time series 12. Um, UTSA is 12-15 and 15 against FAU. Most recently was last year where UTSA opened conference play against them and went 3-0. and Last The series won last year was the first time since 2017 that UTSA won a series against them. Now, they haven't played every single year. There's been some years where they didn't play FAU, maybe just the size of the conference and everything. The other thing, and, and you know, when you have, like, wins and losses that cover so many years, and, and when you have collegiate sports like, like you have with – Division One baseball, where the roster is flipping over, at least every few years. Now, even more so in some ways with the transfer portal, but sometimes this stat is a little bit of an outlier. You kind of look at it a little differently. But UTSA is two and seven when playing FAU in Florida, so not the best on the road record against them. And then they've played each other in the conference tournament three times, and UTSA is one and two in those in those games. There isn't there's nothing in the record books in terms of FAU like good or bad individual games against FAU. You know some some of those teams are either in the record books for a bad way with most hits allowed, like UTSA most hits allowed, and then sometimes it's a good game where like Chase King just seemed to always have Rice's number when he played, when UTSA played them. Mentioned last year a little bit, FAU was 34 and 25, 16 and 14 in Conference USA. Their RPI was 79, and then they had a disappointing tournament where they went one and two and actually lost to Western Kentucky in both of those games. They lost the first their first game of the tournament by one run, and then they got eliminated by Western Kentucky losing uh, by two runs. So very close games. They finished fourth overall in the regular season standings. Uh, this year, they are off to a 25-24 and 24 start, 11-13 in the American Athletic Conference. And I think they're like fifth based on the seed, like based on the records and tied. Yeah, so they're, they're fifth right now in – in the conference standings, they're tied with three other teams at 11 and 13, UAB, Charlotte, and Rice. But then FAU has their – FAU is above those teams because of their overall record. And so they're, they're going to have some stuff to play for. Before we talk about more with the conference and just the conference outlook and with how close everything is and – those scenarios I mentioned for UTSA. Let's get a little bit into FAU from the mound. If you listen to last week's episode, I mentioned there was a little bit of a difference between like the, the stats on the conference website and a resource I use a lot, d1baseball.com and thebaseballcube.com. I noticed when I was doing my prep work for this weekend series that the conference stats, while the standings are up to date and some of the games played are up to date, the actual stats are a little outdated. When they were last updated was a few weeks ago, and that would explain why some of those stat categories weren't lining up. So I didn't reference the the American website at all for this. Mostly just used D1Baseball.com and the Baseball Cube. But FAU for the mound... They've got a 4.98 team ERA, so a little better than South Florida and a little better than UTSA, who's sitting at a 5.44. The the whips for for both teams are almost identical. FAU's at 1.51, and that's walks plus hits per innings pitched. UTSA is at 1.50. Strikeouts, they're... Pretty on par or almost identical. FAU has 418 strikeouts. UTSA has 420. FAU does have more wild pitches at 40 versus UTSA's 34 to hit batter and then also more hit batters. FAU has hit 49 batters and UTSA has hit 
31. When you look at the walks, it's interesting because FAU walks a lot more. Like, their pitchers walk a lot more batters than, than UTSA pitchers do. FAU pitchers have walked 227 batters, where UTSA has walked just 171. But looking ahead real quick towards, like, at the plate, FAU from the plate has walked 236 times, and UTSA has only walked 171. So FAU draws a lot of walks at the plate, and they have a much better on base percentage than their team batting average but then they also walk a lot of batters too so hopefully UTSA can capitalize that at the plate and do a little better of bringing runners in not leaving runners on base finding those extra base hits and getting runs early with those free passes being issued whether it's the hit by pitches or the walks And then, you know, you look at runs allowed per nine, and this obviously is going to be a little different than the ERA because ERA, of course, is only factoring earned runs, but runs allowed per nine looks at all the runs scored, so errors, whatnot. FAU, their runs allowed per nine is 5.73, where... UTSA is a 6.01. So still overall better pitching in terms of runs and, and runs scored. FAU has allowed 269 runs with only 234 of those earned. And then UTSA has allowed 265 runs, er, earned runs, excuse me, with 293 runs. So, you, you know, the, the ERA numbers and the runs allowed num- numbers are lower. So, of course, their pitching isn't is is doing better than UTSA, but it's still like in the grand scheme of things, you know, pretty close. Not not like identical, but it's not a huge separator. They do have four pitchers on their staff with over 50 percent of the ground ball of generating the ground ball, and then UTSA has twelve batters with a ground ball rate over 50%. Now, there's a couple things to dig deeper into with that, and we're not going to do it this time because we've done it before, but you have to look at number of at-bats. Not all ground balls equal an out. You know, we we don't really, on these episodes, have enough time to, to dig into that. I haven't really found anything that separates that it's probably out there but again you know having the time to dig into that week in and week out takes a little more time and so it's a good overview or bird's eye view rather of looking at the, the ground ball rate but you always with with any stat there's a lot of factors that go into it when you start to get into the saber metrics and the analytics and you kind of get down this rabbit trail of you know you find one stat but then you have to find two or three to interpret that one then you have to find two or three to interpret that one and next thing you know you're starting to get like super into the weeds with the advanced saver metrics so basically the biggest takeaway with that is utsa tends to hit ground balls a little more often and that can result in some of the things we've seen with the double plays they've hit into the field of choices they've hit into and why teams have been able to leave the UTSA runners on and then the box score left on base number is always a little higher. So players to watch for pitchers for FAU for the Owls. Um they've got, you know, one of their starters, he kind of is just having a better year than the other guys, CJ Williams. He's got a 3.09 ERA. He averages, you know, just under six innings pitched per outing. The official number is 5.78. Obviously, like, you know, what's 5.78 of an inning when innings are 
measured in like 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, but pretty close to like he has the, I guess we'll say this, he has the ability based on his average in his pitch and everything to go into the sixth inning or later. And, you know, you, we've seen in recent weeks when the starting pitcher can do that, they're hitting a groove. You know, UTSA is having a hard time really putting a lot of pressure on on that pitcher. He's getting out of jams. And then, you know, most teams are going to have at least one or two solid bullpen guys. And if you can get into the sixth, even the seventh, then you turn it over to that bullpen guy. And it's a lot different than forcing the team to go to those middle relievers that are maybe struggling a little bit or a coach doesn't want to use up his ace right away. So you've got a little more opportunity to benefit on on putting runs on the board. Williams has thrown one complete game shutout. So again, just definitely has it in him to to go go for her length and then he's got a 214 opponent batting average. He has given up eight home runs and so that makes his FIP a little higher. You know, FIP is fielding independent pitching, so it's kind of looking at a pitcher's earned runs for only what they're responsible for. And, you know, his FIP is at a 5.27, so the even though UTSA has struggled a little bit as of late to hit the home run ball consistently and multiple in a game, Williams is somebody that maybe they can capitalize on that against. And then, you know, just mentioned the ground ball and leaving runners on. Williams does have an 81% runners left on base percentage. So, again, he's really good at working on jams, you know, gets that ground ball to turn the double play, limits the limits the damage when runners get on the base paths. There are other two weekend guys, Trey Beard and Tyler Murphy. Murphy, I'm assuming, you know, you look at his game started and his appearances, and it's pretty close to what a starter would be. He only averages about three innings pitched per outing. So I don't know if he's struggled a little bit or maybe they were using him in a different role, and now he has kind of worked himself into a weekend starter. And we've seen that with some UTSA guys. Like we've seen some guys who started were one of the weekend starters kind of shifted back to like more of an opener or middle reliever, even maybe a Tuesday role. But now they've worked themselves back into a weekend starter. So maybe that's the case with Murphy. Maybe they just like using him on, on a Sunday as like a bullpen by committee type of guy, have him open, give two or three good innings, and then turn it into their middle relievers. But Beard and Murphy, their ERA is either for – Beard at like five runs allowed or for Murphy closer to five. And then mentioned this already with Murphy, but Beard as well has less average in each pitch than, than Williams. So from the starting perspective, Williams is the one to look out for, but then there are other guys, there's potential there. And, and there's been times where UTSA has let, the opposing pitcher have a better outing than maybe his numbers show. And so they're just going to have to jump on them early and, and really have good at bats and put the ball in play. And hopefully they, hopefully they can capitalize against all three of them. You know, looking at the bullpen guys for FAU, one name that stood out to me, Ben Gilbert, 14 appearances, but just 10 innings pitched, 10.2 innings pitched, but a low ERA. You know, not sure with Gilbert if if he's had some some tougher outings or maybe he maybe there's been times where he's come in to face one or two batters and then they go to somebody else or maybe there's been times when he comes in to close it out and only registers you know an innings pitch or two thirds of an innings pitch. But Gilbert is somebody to just with the numbers keep an eye out. But then they're Definitely their main bullpen guy, probably their closer, Danny Trehe. 23 appearances, 39 innings pitched, 
60 strikeouts, 21 walks, 2.06 ERA, and a 161 opponent batting average. And then Trey Hay has even a better left on base percentage than than Williams. Trey Hayes is 88.8. So kind of that's that situation I was talking about where if Williams can give you six or seven innings and then Trey Hay can come in and have a two inning save, that would that's a situation that UTSA obviously wants to avoid because you don't really tap into the bullpen. You're facing some solid pitching and you want to, you know, really get things kicked off on Thursday on a good note. From the plate, FAU, you know, managed a little or me- mentioned a little bit. I don't know why I said managed. I apologize for that. Mentioned mentioned previously, they're only hitting two fifty six as a team, but their on base percentage with all those walks is three sixty five. So. Just because their batting average is, isn't maybe what you would want it to be, or they would want it to be, they still manage to find ways to get on base. And they've got some runners that can steal bases, are good on the base paths. So, similar to UTSA, they can find creative ways to get on base, and then they can move runners up and put pressure on a pitcher with runners in scoring position quickly utsa you know for comparison is hitting three four three or four as, as a team fau is slugging 395 where utsa is slugging 449 and where that difference comes from you know both teams have almost identical home runs hit utsa has about 21 more doubles hit than fau utsa has hit 92 fau's only hit 71 and then utsa has hit eight triples and FAU's only hit three. So, you know, hitting wise, pretty similar across the board. FAU is hit into 26 ground ball double plays. UTSA is hit into 23. And then, you know, looking at the ground ball rate, FAU only has five batters with over 50% of ground ball rate. And UTSA only has three pitchers that have generated the ground ball over 50% of the time. And one of those pitchers, Anthony Gianetti, has only logged like 1.2 innings pitched. So very, take it with a grain of salt, essentially two pitchers on on the staff have generated the ground ball 50% of the time. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean you're turning a double play every time. That could be... You know, it just it gets through the infield or they hit it up the middle at 100 miles per hour off the bat and it's a ground ball, but you're not stopping it. So players to watch. Christian Adams, second baseman, 324, 446, 516 slug for an OPS of 962. Adams leads the team in hits. He's got 47 strikeouts, but he's also got, also got 37 walks, so gets on base a lot. And you see that with, you know, the average is good, but then the OBP just south of 450. And then Adams has six stolen bases, eight home runs, 11 doubles, 27 RBIs. Right fielder, John Schrader, you know, a little less of a stat line than Adams just hitting 285. Pretty decent OBP, 381. Schrader, though, he he strikes out a lot, 56 strikeouts. Walks about half that amount of time with 27, but leads the team with 44 RBIs. So um, he's done that through team leading 12 doubles, team leading nine home runs. So definitely, you know, probably across the board, Schrader is their most dangerous hitter. Um you know, Adams brings a lot to the plate as well, but and Adams gets on base a little more, but Schrader can do more damage. And so I think that uh, is something to watch for. And then center fielder Spencer Rich, you know, the stat line isn't the best, but 16 stolen bases and 19 attempts. So Rich is somebody, you know, you look at all those walks and everything. If he can get on base, 
and you know has the speed to steal second, maybe to steal third. And then just one more individual in terms of like extra base hits, left field, Carter Brady, seven doubles, seven home runs. So they've got a handful of guys that can hit the home run ball and can punish you with extra base hits. And, you know, hopefully UTSA can continue to play good defense. Or, or you know, it wasn't great this past weekend, but overall there were some big defensive moments. So I guess hopefully it's better, it's more appropriate to say, hopefully they can find that again and turn out a, a good defensive performance and, you know, not rush throws, not be afraid to, you know, I'm probably not going to get that runner even with a good throw. I'll just pocket the ball. And ultimately, you want to see them just play good baseball. And, and if they can do that, hopefully they can find themselves on on the the correct side of the win-loss column after the weekend. You know, sometimes you see teams play good baseball and the other team's playing good baseball too. And you just lose a close game. The reason, of course, you want to see them come out on top with the series and, and just play good baseball is what we hinted to, at, or what I hinted to at the start of the episode, rather, with the possibility of the regular season title still being in play. So, you know, just real quick, looking at the conference outlook as a whole, UTSA is currently number two, a game back from ECU. UTSA holds the tiebreaker against ECU by winning the regular season series. And from what I could tell, that only that tiebreaker only comes into play when when it's between like when it's four, like who the number one seed is versus the number two seed. I think any other like tiebreakers, they just go with the overall record based on how the standings are laid out and, and everything. FAU mentioned already at number five. So been given this stat the last couple of weeks as it's been relevant, but three games separate number three. Who's Tulane now after their big weekend over ECU from number nine? Who is USF? And two games separate number three from number eight. Number eight is Rice. So obviously the three games separating number three from number nine, that one's going to be a little tougher to because now you're going to have some of these teams play each other. It's the last weekend. So making up three games would involve like a sweep of a team, which is certainly possible as we saw a couple times this weekend, the two games, that's probably a little closer. And you know, it's, it's number three from number eight. So it's not a matter of being left another tournament, but it's like, are you going to be a three seed? And you know, now you're playing a team and, and maybe you're the home team Maybe you got a better, more, a more favorable time time slot, or you the eight eight seed, and you're playing likely ECU or UTSA. Maybe Tulane. Maybe Tulane has enough to hop up there. It would take essentially a sweep, like Tulane sweeping a team and UTSA getting swept, which you know it's baseball. It's not outside the possibility, but. You know, it, it's it, it's going to be interesting, basically, to see how this weekend shakes shapes out, and just the matchups. You know, you've got UTSA playing FAU, Tulane is playing Charlotte. Charlotte's caught up in that wash of eleven and thirteen, so they could go as high as like number three. They could drop down to number eight. Wichita State is playing Memphis. Memphis is two games back from FAU, who's the five seed, and and all those teams that are tied. But Memphis is currently in 10th place and not in the tournament, so they're going to have a lot to be playing for. ECU is playing Rice, and UAB is playing USF. So uh, we've seen kind of all conference play. These teams have beat each other up. You know, there's been a couple sweeps here and there, but most, in a lot of cases, almost every team has beat every team at least once in, for one game. So it's going to be an exciting final weekend. Hopefully all three games for all the teams can get get played. And, and finally, finishing up, here's the 
scenario for like UTSA scenario. So ECU is 16 and 8, UTSA is 15 and 9 in American Athletic Conference play. Quick math, ECU has to lose one more game than UTSA. So anything that UTSA wins wins more games or ties UTSA's weekend record. So they come out of after Saturday and they both you know, they both go one and two, they both go two and one, they both go three and oh, they both go oh and three, would mean ECU would be regular season champions. But if UTSA can win one more game than ECU, then EC, then UTSA would have the tiebreaker. And maybe they can win it outright. That's not totally outside the possibility. But the scenarios for for UTSA to come out on top uh, at, at a minimum, I guess, is either UTSA goes 3-0 and and ECU goes 2-1. and UTSA goes 2-1. and ECU goes 1-2. and and UTSA or UTSA goes one and two and ECU goes 0 and three. I don't think ECU would go 0 and three again. I mean, Rice is playing good and they've got some solid pitching. ECU seems to be a little beat up on the mound. Roots still seems to be injured. I think they've got some injured bullpen guys and some some of the more better bullpen guys are injured. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting to watch. Um, but that's basically what needs to happen. And, you know, as I mentioned, the final weekend preview of the regular season, still have plans with Jared and Adrian to do a conference tournament preview. Don't have the official details on that yet of when we're planning that out. But, of course, want to planning on getting that to you before the tournament starts of course um yeah but for now thanks as always for for listening thanks for your support all season and hopefully we've got a lot more baseball to talk about as we move into middle may middle of may end of may early june but we'll see what happens if not it's been a crazy ride it's been fun and for now birds up